Sin may look appealing to the eyes, but in the end it is the way of death. Therefore let us escape the lusts of the flesh and pursue righteousness. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Jesus taught us that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. With that being the case, we would do well to follow Job's example, where he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes, why then should I look upon a young woman? Let us not only follow Job's example, but let us say and do as King David said in Psalm 101, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. For oh how terrible a sin can become, a sin that merely starts with the eyes. Just look at Adam and Eve. They saw the tree of knowledge of good and evil with what? With their eyes. And with their eyes they lusted after it, and later acted out their lustful desires which overtook them leading them to so great a sin. Let us realize and keep in mind how something as simple as looking at the tree turned into such a great sin. Such a great sin that the world is now in such a fallen state. In James we read, The tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. But let us remember that it is the same case with our eyes, for as Christ said, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So just as the tongue is a world of iniquity, so are the eyes potentially a world of iniquity condemning you to hell. For as Christ said, It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. More profitable. Jesus didn't say this to sound spiritual or to give more meaning to his message. He meant it. For God knows our heart better than we know it ourselves, and He knows that if we would commit certain acts in our minds, then we would also commit those same acts in reality if the opportunity were to present itself. That is why an internal thought of adultery is as sinful as physically committing the act of adultery. This is why Christ commanded that one is to first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. If we don't physically commit the lustful acts, but we think about them and dwell on them in our minds, then we are no better than the Pharisees, who would appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. They would appear righteous externally, yet inside they were full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Christ strongly condemned this type of practice, this type of hypocrisy, as again, God seeks and examines the heart. And knowing that God seeks our heart, let us protect our heart from the filth of lust. Let us guard it more diligently than how one would guard an earthly treasure such as their bank account or home. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let our treasure be in the kingdom of God, not worldly lusts. Let us guard our eyes to keep our hearts clean. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. And many of these sins listed in Mark 7 can and often do start with the eyes. Now when it comes to sexual sin or lusting of any sort, it may seem hard or even impossible to overcome sometimes. But we need to remember and understand that God has told us that we can through Him overcome any sin. For no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. The way of escape is through His Son, who is able to make us free from the bondage of sin. For we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was on all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It is Christ who can help us overcome any sin or addiction, whether it be sexual sin or alcohol or a drug addiction, the Son can indeed set us free. But in regards to sexual sin, we need to understand that every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. 
Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The word here for sexual immorality in the Greek is pornuo. Pornuo means to act the harlot, to indulge in unlawful lust, including sexual lust, and it can even mean to practice idolatry, and that is exactly what lust is, it is idolatry. It is taking the image on the screen or in the flesh and exalting it to a level above God, where we put the will of God for our lives to the side and ignore it. The will of God which is for our own good, we put it aside so that we can instead fall into our own harmful sins, fulfilling our own sinful nature where we become slaves of a new master, slaves of lust and sexual sin. But we are not called to serve two masters. We are not to be married to the world and its sinful lusts, but we are to be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So let us keep ourselves pure and keep ourselves from committing adultery and idolatry against God by fornicating with the world. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness which is idolatry. Let's worship God and God alone. Let's not fall into lust and covetousness which as Colossians 3 verse 5 states is idolatry. Let's trust God as it is He who can solve our problems. It is He who can deliver us out of any circumstances. Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Again, we read the command to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Christ gave us commands to live by, and they include ways that we can overcome lusting by protecting our eyes. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? If we constantly watch TV shows or movies or even worse, pornography, full of perversion and carnality, what do we expect but for our whole body to be full of darkness? It's like the saying, you are what you eat. In a sense, you are what you look at, as that is what fills your mind. If therefore what you look at is darkness and sinful, how dark and sinful will your insides be? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And that little leaven can and often does start with the eyes. But that leaven could also have to do with your surroundings, which is why in 1 Corinthians 5 verses 9 to 11 we read, not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. So let us choose our friends carefully, let us choose friends that will help us grow, not friends that will instead hinder our growth. Moving on, we are all familiar with the story of Esau and how he sold his birthright for some lentil stew. And many of us will look and say that he was crazy for doing that, saying how could you ever do something so foolish? But little do we realize that there are people doing this every day, maybe not with lentil stew, but with alcohol, drugs, or sexual sin instead. Through Christ we may have eternal life, and an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven. Yet, so many people trade this inheritance that they may receive through faith for something as worthless as lentil stew, something temporary, something perishable, whether it be alcohol, drugs, or sexual sin, or some other type of lust. And all these forms of lust do not satisfy, for as Hebrews 11 says, they are merely passing pleasures, but in the end, they only bring sorrows, pain, and worst of all, death. There are many other examples of terrible sins which started with lust, from David and Bathsheba to Samson and Solomon's lust for foreign women which ultimately led to many sorrows and consequences. Therefore we should guard our eyes and learn from their mistakes. Let your eyes look straight ahead, and let your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. 
and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. Walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we know that the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Therefore, let us seek to do the will of God rather than seek our own will. Let us seek to be holy just as He is holy. Before this video ends, I just want to say a few more things. First off, if we want to overcome lust, we really, really need to pray. One can't stress the importance of prayer enough. For it is through prayer and the grace of God that we can overcome any sin. But at the same time, let us also follow the teachings given throughout scripture as we pray for God's deliverance. And as you follow the teachings and obey them, then God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As we saw earlier in the video, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Let's understand this passage, let's obey it. When we pass by a woman, don't make a second look to just see what she looks like or admire her beauty as some would word it. But let's be honest with ourselves. You are not just seeing what she looks like or admiring her beauty, you are lusting. So keep from even making the first look. It's not needed and it will only lead to more sin. There is no reason that if we have the Holy Spirit and if we make a conscious effort to keep our eyes from lusting with prayer, that through God's grace we can't overcome lust. Again, let us do as Job did. Let us make a covenant with our eyes to not look upon a woman to lust after her. Let us guard our hearts and minds by saying, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. But above all this, instead of trying to stop lusting after a woman, let us love that woman as ourselves. As the great commandment says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we concentrate on loving our neighbor as ourself, then lust won't be an option. If we truly love our neighbor as ourself, then we will see a woman passing by for more than just her physical appearance, which in the end will only fade away. We need to view women as God does, not as the world does. In 1 Peter 3 verses 3 and 4, it says that true beauty in a woman is not found in her physical appearance. And women are told, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. A woman who has these qualities is very precious in God's sight. And if we have the Holy Spirit, these qualities, the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit should be very precious in our sight too. It is this true beauty that we should be seeking in a woman above all else. So sisters, clothe yourselves with a beauty which is precious to God, which will not perish, and in doing so you will attract a man that will love you as he should. And you will not cause your brother to stumble by dressing inappropriately, but instead you will help him in his walk by your godly character and by your devotion to Christ. But in regards to an immoral woman who does not know God, brothers, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. We must always keep in mind that charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So let us pursue a woman who fears the Lord, and only a woman of that type. Let us know the worth of a virtuous woman, for her worth is far above rubies. To end this video, I just want to say that we need to always remember that God is infinitely greater than any sin. And we know that when we sin, our fellowship with God is broken, our joy in the Lord is gone. We also know that even just one second of the joy of the Lord surpasses all the pleasures and joy the world can offer us. So let us always pursue to walk in God's light and have that joy. For when that joy is there, sin has no attraction, sin has no power, for God is far greater.